Hi, my name is Bryn Boslett, and I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of California in San Francisco. And today I'm going to be talking to you about viral hepatitis, particularly hepatitis C virus. By the end of this session, you should be able to describe the epidemiology, modes of transmission, and pathogenesis of infection with hepatitis C. You should know the outcomes of infection, including the establishment of a chronic state. You should be able to list the serologic tests used for the diagnosis of hepatitis C, and you should be able to describe some of the complications of hepatitis C infection and understand a little bit about the treatment options. Hepatitis C is the most common chronic blood-borne infection in the United States today. Like hepatitis B, this virus can lead to both acute and chronic infection, and it does represent the leading cause of liver transplantation and hepatocellular carcinoma in the United States. Worldwide, the highest overall prevalence for hepatitis C virus exists in North Africa, the Middle East, and Central and East Asia. The transmission of hepatitis C is in blood and body fluids, and as such, within the U.S., IV drug use and sexual risk factors are the main reasons for hepatitis C virus transmission. There have been seven different genotypes of hepatitis C described to date. In the U.S., genotype 1 infection is the most prevalent, with subtype A being slightly more common than subtype B. Genotype 2 and 3 are the next most common genotypes, infecting around 30% of the population of hepatitis C patients. Genotype 4 exists in the U.S., but is relatively rare. The reason that genotype is so important is because it is what helps us direct the type of therapy we're going to use against the virus, and it also somewhat predicts the response to treatment. Hepatitis C is a non-enveloped, single-stranded RNA virus composed of close to 10,000 base pairs, which encodes a 3,000 amino acid polyprotein, which creates 10 total virus proteins. The genome encodes three structural proteins, shown here in purple, and seven non-structural proteins, shown here in pink. It is the non-structural proteins that provide us with multiple drug targets. Because of rapid virus turnover, hepatitis C makes about a trillion copies of itself per day, as well as poor proofreading of the virus um, by its RNA polymerase, there is a large genetic variability to the hepatitis C virus. Similar to hepatitis B, hep C is non-cytolytic. It does not directly cause hepatocyte cell death. Instead, cell death results from cytotoxic T-cell-mediated lysis. In cases where the infection becomes chronic, ongoing inflammation in the liver can lead to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Unlike hepatitis B, the antibodies to hep C do not offer any immunity against the virus. Furthermore, hepatitis C particles in related proteins may precipitate immune complexes, which, once formed, can affect many different organs, including the skin, kidneys, and peripheral nerve fibers. Viral proteins also confer peculiar physical and chemical properties on the body's cryoimmunoglobulins, which can later lead to a condition known as cryoglobulinemia, which can lead to a vasculitis. The test of choice to diagnose hepatitis C infection is through hepatitis C serologies, which can be processed through the enzyme immunoassay, or EIA, test. It's important to realize that hepatitis C antibodies usually do not form right away. It takes the body between 8 and 12 weeks after the initial infection to be able to produce detectable hepatitis C antibodies. And by 6 months, over 97% of people will be able to be tested for hepatitis C through an antibody test. However, if you have somebody coming into the hospital or your clinic with symptoms of acute hepatitis, you want to remember that the test to send is the hepatitis C RNA PCR because hepatitis C RNA can be detected as soon as two weeks after the person's infection. 
Also remember that while liver function tests such as AST and ALT may be elevated in the acute setting, for patients with more chronic hepatitis C, these tests may be completely normal. Unlike hepatitis B infection, in which most newly infected adults are able to clear the virus, hepatitis C infection establishes a chronic state in the majority of patients, close to 80% or more who become infected. Around a quarter of those patients will go on to develop liver fibrosis and eventual cirrhosis of of the liver over a period of of between 20 and 30 years. A smaller percentage of those patients will also unfortunately go on to develop hepatocellular carcinoma and end-stage liver disease, which can only be treated with liver transplant. Whenever patients contract hepatitis C at an older age, or they have heavy alcohol use, or co-infection with other viruses that affect the liver, such as HIV and hepatitis B, the rates and likelihood of progression to end-stage liver disease are higher. Unfortunately, many adults do not know that they are at risk of these severe complications of hepatitis C because many do not know that they are infected in the first place. Even fewer patients achieve a cure of their hepatitis C, known as a sustained virologic response, or SVR. In terms of prevention, there is unfortunately no vaccine currently available for hepatitis C. Blood product screening was initiated in 1982, soon after the discovery of the virus, and the U.S. blood supply is currently considered to be quite safe. Treatment of patients infected with hep C is one important strategy to help prevent new transmissions. It is estimated that the majority of undiagnosed cases of hep C exist in the baby boomer generation, so... Adults born between the years of 1946 and 1965 are now recommended to have at least a one-time screening of hepatitis C antibody in order to exclude this diagnosis. The treatment of hep C is a rapidly evolving field, so I do not want to go into too many details, but I will present some of the history of hepatitis C therapy and briefly review some of the newest therapies. The first treatments available for hepatitis C were interferon alpha combined with ribavirin, which had very broad antiviral properties. This combination has been in use from 1998 onward and up until very recently had been the mainstay of therapy for hepatitis C. Unfortunately, the outcomes of this therapy were not very good. Genotype 2 and 3 patients responded pretty well up to 80% of the time, but The most common genotype in the U.S., genotype 1, had only around a 50% response rate. On top of that, these therapies needed to be given for many months and also had many side effects. Interferon was also given as an injection, so for many patients this was pretty difficult to take. There wasn't much progress in the fight against hepatitis C until the past few years. In 2011, a new class of medications known as the first-generation protease inhibitors entered the market. These medications, specifically named bosepervir and telaprevir, were able to increase cure rates in the tough-to-treat genotype 1 population, but still only got patients to about an 80% cure rate. Sadly, these medications needed to be added to interferon and ribavirin, so patients now had even more side effects to deal with. Then, in 2014, a second generation of protease inhibitors, as well as several newer agents that target other viral proteins, were introduced into the market. Specifically, these agents are known as the NS5A and NS5B inhibitors. You may hear about some of them in the news. One important NS5B is a drug called cefospavir. One important NS5A is a drug known as ledipasvir. However, there are new drugs coming onto the market every day. Unlike the first generation protease inhibitor agents, these new medications are able to be given all on their own without interferon and ribavirin. Therefore, they have much lower side effects. Additionally, cure rates with these newer all-oral regimens can approach as close to 100% for many genotype 1 cases. 
By 2015, the co-formulation of many classes of drugs into fixed-dose combination pills makes it possible in some cases for patients to take just one pill once per day for as little as eight weeks and achieve a cure of their hepatitis C virus. For patients who unfortunately progress to cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease, liver transplantation is the only hope for long-term survival. Hepatitis C-related cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma is the number one cause of liver transplant in the U.S. today. Like other hepatitis viruses, there are occasionally cases of acute fulminant hepatitis C requiring transplantation, but this complication is relatively rare with this virus. Here is a table that you can use when studying to compare and contrast some of the different features and characteristics of the hepatitis viruses. Here are my image references. Thank you so much for your time and attention.